invitation uh, to speak here. Um, the public turn uh, in my title, I am addressing, of course, uh, we're doing outreach uh, already for quite some decades, a uh, fantastic example we just heard. But on the other hand, um, there are still parts of archaeology uh, that are not open to, uh, to participation of the broader public. And I, so I will address metal detection, most of it. What for the Antiquities of the Netherlands is a project where we gather um, objects found by private metal detection. Uh, but I will argue a bit why we do that and why I think that uh, deserves to be followed. Um, because opening up archaeology on, on many other fields that are still now closed and, and just managed by professionals uh, is, I think, a good response uh, to the uh, current trend of mistrust against academics. In times of Brexit, fake news and Trumpism, science, and especially the alpha sciences, um, are increasingly seen as elitist um, and taking up uh, money-consuming resources. Uh, so to frame it more positive, on the other hand, um, there is this ch challenge uh, to democratize uh, science and, uh, of course, archaeology. So this democratization has three pillars, the sharing, open access public publication, anyone should be able to access it, it should not be, be behind the paywall, um, explaining, outreach to the public, and then, well, not in the easy way, um, really by specialists who know uh, how to bring this to the public in their own language. And third is participation. Doing research is not a monopoly of professionalism. Um, in the field of history, her heritage and archaeology, um, this takes the form of the question, who owns the past? And implicit, of course, the answer is it's not owned by the professionals. We're not the only one entitled to write up what our history was. And already in 1952, UNESCO devoted papers to this, and the Human Rights Article 27 actually states the right to research. But going in the different direction was the, uh, the, the effect of not the meaning, of course, not, not the intention, but the actual effect of Lavaletta was an increasing professionalization, a huge pro professional sectors, and in the Netherlands, there were, for instance, regulations that this task should be done by an archaeologist of this uh, level. Um, and uh, private uh, people were actually, for a time, um, not able to participate in excavations. Um, attention for non-professionals returned at Faro and participatory heritage is luckily now a key term also in governmental circles. So the case of metal detection. Archaeologists in many countries are opposed to it. Um, and that is uh, partly because of our principle of preservation in situ. Later, research is more effective if the site is uh, complete and remains complete. So when, uh, and damage uh, to sites is feared and damage to the integrity of the find collection. And of course, there are excesses by metal detectorists. But um, look, I want to uh, stay uh, to, to pause a minute by the perspective of the metal detector hobbyists. They just want to keep a piece of history. They just want to do research. They want to find and, 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 and have the past in their hands. Um, so we should acknowledge that. And second, they are not aware of our principle uh, preservation in situ. So they, they think archaeology is about finding stuff, isn't it? I'm finding stuff. Why is that not okay? Um, so we should explain better um, uh, what our motives are. A third is, and they're right, I think, that ploughing does the damage. As, so, as long as they're restricted to the topsoil, they're not doing extra damage in most of the countries of uh, mid and uh, northwestern Europe. Um, so, yeah, they're not doing a lot of damage if they restrict themselves. So, um, I will not go too far into this because, of course, in several countries it is legally banned. Um, but I think then we are monopolizing archaeology um, and say, we're doing it, you're not. And there are good reasons for it, but it, um, well, it is monopolizing and people are not understanding it. And this could be a reason why they think archaeology is elitist. And, they, uh, and I've heard literally comments like, yeah, those archies want to keep everything for themselves. So they get angry and then ignore the law. So we should be really looking at their motives and then, if possible by the law, uh, include them in the search. So this is why in the Netherlands, uh, the previous situation is 40 years of illegal but generally tolerated <coughs> metal detection, a low level of reporting. So 
uh, the rule was that chance fines had to be reported, um, but they hardly did. And well, there are some backgrounds uh, for that. In 2016, the law was changed. Metal detection allowed in the 30 centimeters of the topsoil, no extra damage. Um, of course, banned on scheduled monuments. Um, find reports are mandatory, and so we keep the information. And actually, science benefits, scholarly work benefits from it. And I can say already that the 2017 reporting rate is at least 50% higher than it was in 2015 before the ban. And I say at least because at the moment still find reports over 2017 are coming in. So why ban is for the scientific uh, importance, huge potential for the study of the past in the uh, form of, for, uh, for instance, distribution maps, networks, habitation patterns, human mobility, etc. Societal relevance. If we discover more sites reported by the metal detectors, we know how to protect them if, uh, if, for instance, developments take place. And we see it as a huge opportunity for citizen science, an improved link between academia, heritage and the broader public, and really let them participate. It's not, yeah, give us your finds, but they can take part in documenting them if they want. So why in 2016? Uh, we feel a sense of urgency because metal detection started in the 70s, and the first guys doing it are already very old or already passed away. And we don't want the, the objects, but of course we need the location. So they have to pass it on to us orally. Um, and of course, the new heritage. Before that, I could not uh, legally um, apply for funding to do this, of course. So our aims are the systematic documentation of the collection of private <coughs> people making the finds available for heritage and academic research and the broader public. So not a black box, not just a, a government database, but true open access. Uh, online publication in a durable national database linked to open data principles, improving the relationship between the detecting community and the professional archeology, span and also doing this in a European sphere uh, with, uh, for instance, the Finnish partners and the British partners um, and the Flemish partners. We're a broad national uh, cooperation. This is not just the undertaking of one university, no, several uh, universities, the Heritage Agency, um, uh, provinces uh, and museums, and of course, associations of hobby archaeologists. Um, so their roles, what roles could the private individuals undertake? Of course, they could just declare their finds. Some say, here is our finds. I don't know what to do with it. You do it. Uh, that's fine. But after training, some of them register uh, their own collection and register the finds from others. And um, some of them are really not knowledgeable. Uh, for instance, I had great trouble finding in academic libraries uh, uh, literature on medieval keys. There is a lot of collector's literature on medieval keys, but hardly uh, academic studies. But there are detectors with uh, uh, a library of their own just on keys. Um, and they assist in the find identifications and they write up our standardized um, identifications, which I will uh, say a bit more later. And they receive, of course, the credit for that. So they become the co-authors of these identification sheets. So how do we approach them? Because there is still mistrust between detector users and archaeologists, and there are some illegal things happening. But we're mm -hmm. inviting uh, to contribute those willing to report and we communicate best practices. And we've come, uh, after uh, one and a half years of talks, we've come to a code of conduct. Um, so that was actually active talks. What do you think that you, that detectors should do? And what? Uh, and we explained what we think uh, and how the principles work. So actually, there is a document that is half uh, legal rules, simple. They are there. Uh, and the other one is uh, also conduct. Um, so not exactly the, 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 the legal rules, but well, rules of behavior. Um, and they were proposed by the detectorists. They say, yeah, we know we shouldn't uh, uh, leave fences open and we should refill the holes um, because otherwise you annoy the landowner. So um, yeah, this was a co-creation and it was signed by all the uh, uh, amateur uh, organizations. Uh, so we have two national associations and they agree to it and advise their uh, members to follow this. Um, we're winning their trust by protected data. They, of course, their names are not visible online. Their location, their exact location, they um, give their exact location to us. 
scholars can access them, but not uh, the, the, uh, the, an anonymous visitor of the website uh, because they don't like that other people are accessing their site. So for instance, this brooch, uh, we know the exact find spot, but online it's attributed to a whole municipality. Um, we take into account their wishes. Um, so the current states uh, were started, well, almost precisely three years ago. Um, over 600 metal detecting individuals uh, take part, 6,000 locations, 60,000 finds registered. Among them are 61 halls, and now some 21,000 uh, are already fully processed and available online which is too low for my liking, this is 37%. Um, but the reason is, as I already explained, we're working with these standardized uh, descriptions. So you have to think a big dividing line here. This is the actual find. It's a fragment from a copper alloy gilded. It has dimensions, the material, the ownership, mostly private collection, but sometimes they donated it to a museum. Um, so actual find, and this is a standardized reference sheet. Um, and it takes, of course, uh, quite a while to write this up. Um, but then if you have 100 of these objects, you just simply connect them uh, to the reference type. So in the end, it will save a lot of time, but writing up these uh, takes some time. So PAN is actually two things. It's a documentation and publication of privately owned artifacts. It's a reference collection for metal finds, bilingual. Um, the reference collection can be searched independently from find reports. Objects and reference types are available as a URIs uh, with their each of their own makeup, um, of their own uh, format, and international connections and expansions are possible. So we're, we have uh, a model at least for a European uh, thesaurus, um, digitally available. So everything we do is open access. Of course, uh, limited open access, we're not giving the site details to other detectors, but scholars uh, who are a recognized researcher uh, can access them. So our public website uh, allows you to, uh, to filter objects by period. You can search the map for finds in, uh, in the municipalities or, or the provinces. The reference collection uh, you can access here. Uh, it's a tree-like structure, so you start with broad categories and you can funnel that down to the objects you're looking for. Um, and after a login, scholars can analyze and export the data, and volunteers have their own management tool, the collection management tool. So, a bit about the results, because I want to move now forward to my last point about the value for society. Um, there are simply some spectacular finds, uh, like this uh, golden talk uh, with an inscription, um, very rare and we're pleased that there was actually a new find made and truthfully declared. Um, interesting for the public, objects I think are appealing to the public, so these are also providing um, yeah, good tools uh, for outreach and, you can, and of course it's about the stories behind them. And this is a very rare uh, trumpet-headed brooch, uh, Almgren 101, um, by uh, by uh, Astrid Böhme Schönberger called the variant Nexenhof uh, that is just was just known um, uh, from Hungary, and we found uh, one of these. Um, so you can tell stories about long distance movement along the Limex, for instance, by single finds. But it's not on the single finds only. The distributions. Um, a bit more challenging to bring this to the general public, but the story behind this is fascinating. And in this case, it's a story of these Germanic brooches, second, third century, where there are casting molds found here, so we're actually sure that it's made in the Germanic area. Second, third century, Limes is, is well, active, uh, it's upheld, it's, 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 this is the height of the Limes period, of course. But we see that quite, quite uh, a lot of these Germanic brooches are circulating within the province. So this tells a story that this Limes was not an iron curtain. Um, it's not a closed line and Germanic people, non-Romans, take part in this province. It can, could be that there are garrisons, that garrisons consist of Germanic recruits, uh, or Germanic soldiers. It could be that there is an intensive trade so that actually the foreland of the Limes um, provided 
foodstuffs uh, to, the, uh, to the province. But for the larger public, this is an opportunity uh, to explain um, that there is actually, uh, it's not a closed line, um, long distance movement was happening. Um, so, opportunities for archaeology um, is uh, twofold, I think, allowing metal detectors, uh, metal detection answers to policies of participation. Um, citizen science helps to forestall elitist connotations of Roman archaeology. And objects of heritage, the second point is that objects, the results of these uh, kinds of uh, projects is that objects are very suitable, of course, for public outreach. Object and object distributions highlight regional traditions and contact zones. This helps us to underpin stories of cultural diversity and interaction to the broader public. And I think that metal detected finds by non-professionals are posi conceived positively. It, it, it's attractive uh, for newspapers to write up that these were found by private people. So if based on public finds, these results are more acceptable and welcome to the general public. At least that is what I believe. I thank you for your attention.